This is Dr. Charles Parker, and you're listening to Core Brain Journal. It's a place where I connect both fresh discoveries and interesting different perspectives from advanced mind science with the realities of real people and everyday life down on Main Street. Well, welcome aboard, folks. Dr. Charles Parker hosted Core Brain Journal, and I'm so privileged to have the guests on that we have. And we couldn't have a more timely guest on, folks, this evening than Udall, who is not going to go with her full name at this point. She's Udall. It's an unusual name. You might be able to identify her. Keep it a secret if you do. And she's going to talk to us about, get this, have you heard about anything about sexual harassment in the workplace? I mean, were you looking at the news at all for the last, you know, whatever, three months? So we're going to talk about that in just a moment. I want to say, Udall, thank you so much for joining us. We're really looking forward to this. I'm looking forward to this as well. Thank you so much for having me here. It's going to be fun. So CBJ, as you folks know, is sponsored by Direct Health Access Laboratories. With over 3 million studies, they're deep leaders of experience with the big picture of measuring, for example, methylation, cryptopyrrole, and copper challenges. They provide a global service with a molecular focus, and they can do studies in Fargo or Nigeria. It doesn't matter. Stay tuned and head over to dhalab.com forward slash core. That's lab, singular, dhalab.com forward slash core for more specific info on the usefulness of biomedical testing. (laughs) Core Brain Journal is also sponsored by the nonprofit Barry Robinson Center. The teams in Norfolk, Virginia, provide residential care on an evolved family, interpersonal, really, truly comprehensive way. And they have a, it's a global service because they're TRICARE friendly. A lot of their clients come from all over the states and internationally. So what we'd like to do is introduce you to them. What is really important about Barry Robinson is they really have developed a more comprehensive biomedical testing service. And so they have an assessment that includes biomedical testing almost as a standard operating procedure for treatment failure. And that is, uh, to me, outstanding work and not the contemporary practice of medicine. It should be, but it isn't. So go over to Barry Robinson, B-A-R-R-Y Robinson.org forward slash core for more information on their services over there. So let me tell you quickly about Udall, and then we'll find out a lot more about her in just a moment. She has been, for 27 years, folks, operated as a facilitator of transformation by ensuring the synthesis amongst individual, group, and organizational perspectives. She's an organizational consultant. She guides her clients in releasing their chains of slavery, anything that binds, holds, hinders, and stops them from their own personal development so they can take a conscious and effective action in their professional and personal relations so they can grow themselves. And we all know in corporate life, a person can really get stuck with a counterproductive, non-growing corporate management system. So she's an internationally accomplished organizational development consultant with experience managing and implementing projects for government, that is federal, state, and local, and indeed corporate organization. Her specialties include executive coaching, training, design, and development facilitation on this topic tonight, sexual harassment prevention. She lectures on that. And emotional competence, which is emotional intelligence, leadership and team development, diversity programs, she covers the entire scene of organizational development. So let's go ahead. You all tell us more. We, we talked a little bit before, folks, about this, this conversation. And because we don't have, you know, four or five hours, which we could really use, we've got to get a little brief uh, scenario here. And what we've asked you all to do is tell us about herself and how she got into this. That's number one. And the second parenthetical right after a question is, what do you teach people in some kind of summary? I'm sure it's uh, much more comprehensive than 15-minute talk, but do you give us a little bit of an idea of what you say to people 
to actually prevent uh, sexual harassment in the workplace. So first of all, tell us how you, how you got over here and got into this field. Well, you know, interestingly, uh, how did I get into this? This is uh, 20 something years in the making. But I, I guess I was that I was that kid, that teenager in high school who, who loved the, the people stuff, the people issues. I was always helping my friends on their issues. And when I went to college at UVA, I thought I wanted to be a psychologist and, and went to uh, abnormal psych and said, no, no, I don't want to do abnormality. <laughs> and, uh, and so, so when I discovered I didn't want to do abnormality and psych, I went over to sociology to study groups. And that was a love. I just loved it about how can I do this. And so when I went into my first job was in back in the day, it was called personnel, not human resources. So back in the day, I became, I was introduced to training uh, in a personnel office in Georgetown, as a matter of fact, one of my first jobs. Mm. And I took a love to training and uh, became a training specialist and, and uh, decided, though, within my work, I said, wow, training is not effective by itself. You really have to do um, more work. So I discovered OD and I decided, well, if I want to do change, then I have to work with the groups as well, the teens, and then I have to work with the leader, then I have to work with the individuals in the group. So I was constantly learning about all of that and the interaction of individual and group and how the teams and the individuals interact within an organization. And so I found myself always looking at the gap and the synergy and interaction between those entities, the individual, the group, the organization, and how could they all you know, build that synergy so they could work well together. No, so the individual no can... Yeah. Go ahead. I was just going I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just want I know somebody said, OD, what's that? I mean, it's organizational development, folks. It's not overdose. Okay. I just want to be, <laughs> we, have a, we have a, we have a group that's listening to mental health a lot. And, but really, i sorry to interrupt, but I just thought I'd make that clarification because. Oh, no, it's a great clarification because a lot of people don't know what it is. It's organization development. And it's almost like you can uh, akin it to, the, the psychology of the organization as opposed to the psychology of the individual. <laughs> that's an interesting thought, Udall. That's a fantastic thought. Because that would be... no, that's, that's the way I look at it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's a comprehensive thought. All kinds of levels of things going on. So interesting. Mm -hmm. So then how did you take that twist? Of course, it would be interesting because in a way, if you look at boundary discriminations and boundary mismanagement, that would be what would happen in everyday life with an individual. and Exactly. That's the same thing that happens in an organization. Yeah. Well, you know, I have, I have to say, this is the one thing that often people try to separate, but for me, I've always seen it as one, is that oftentimes people look at themselves as an individual, and when I'm out here in my life, I'm an individual, I'm at home, but then it goes to the workplace, they maintain themselves as an individual, but they forget that everything that, sort of happens to you as an individual and that people out in the workplace can actually happen in the workplace. So people don't all of a sudden let go of their humanness because they walk across the threshold of a workplace. If anything, sometimes things about their humanness come out even more so. Mm -hmm. So if you have a desire to be uh, liked at home, then you're going to not lose that desire to be liked at work. Mm -hmm. It's going to show up yeah. even more at work. If you have that desire to, um, you know, that you want to lead or that you want to be in charge at home, there's a good chance it's going to show up at work as well. So um, oftentimes, so that's why I call it the psychology of the workplace, because what happens is you bring all these diverse individuals together and there's an expectation that they will accomplish some task, you know, and work and they will perform and that performance and the task they're accomplishing, you know, assist with the mission of that organization, being able to do what it's claiming it's going to do. But it's all that is humanness that's in there. And that on all the issues that come up and the dynamics uh, and getting these people to move toward the same goal, that's what I do. I, that's the space that I work in. 
So I do yeah. call it the psychology of the organization. It's so interesting, you know, because what happens if you think about it, I mean, I know you know this, I'm talking to you, but I'm actually talking to our listeners because it's just occurring to me. I don't do organizational consultation work. But as you were speaking, I was reflecting upon the number of organizations I've been in that were both inter- encouraging and interesting and uh, dysfunctional. And the dysfunctional level frequently occurs when assumptions are made about varying levels of intimacy. And I'm sure this is something you're going to get into because when you're with a worker person, a coworker colleague, there's a, there's a lot of unwritten, un, un, unmeasured, unrecognized intimacy that takes place, familiarity and, and closeness that's totally appropriate and reasonable as people solve problems together. But I think what happens is, and I, this is what I'd like you to address, please, because that intimacy in the workplace can be uh, surprisingly misunderstood when individuals with different levels of dysfunctional self-esteem enter into that into that soup, because then they're going to be seeking different levels of reassurance, approval, all that sort of thing. So let's go ahead and talk about that. that yes. Yeah. That's a great point that you make because, and that's what I was talking about, about all our stuff, our issues don't go away when we cross that threshold of the workplace. It just shows up in a possible different manner. So yes, intimacy in the workplace. Um, so we have things such as we have, you know, workplace romances because people develop that connection with someone else. We spend more time in the workplace than we do at home. Uh, cause, because part of your time at home is sleeping. So most of our waking hours are in our workplaces, wherever they are. And so, yes, you're going to build connections with people. You're going to have social relationships. You're going to be social because we're social animals. And so there are people that you're going to like. There are people who you're going to love. There are people who you're going to dislike. There are people who you're going to say you hate. Uh, there are people that you're going to be more drawn toward and people that you're going to be absolutely repelled by. And, and, and all of that is there. And we decide how we're going to uh, interact with whatever is showing up for us. And this intimacy in the workplace, sometimes we don't, we think that we can deal with it the same way we deal with it outside of the workplace, but that's not the case because inside of the workplace, the organization actually has, particular rules it has to follow. Uh, There are laws that it has to follow regarding people. So for instance, uh, laws such as those that fall under uh, the Civil Rights Act, such as Mm -hmm. you can't harass people in the workplace, uh, or the the workplace has to be a certain way as far as it can possible. Or, uh, and then the big news, of course, that's, that's all over the news every day. I keep hearing about someone else who is being accused of sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, that's a biggie now because sexual harassment is, uh, the law says it's one thing. And I think there's so many people out here who are claiming sexual harassment. I'm not sure they've read the law yet (laughs) when they're, when they're saying it's sexual Mm -hmm. harassment. Mm -hmm. When they're making that allegation, so so th- so so there. I think a lot of people don't know the rules, and they are unwritten. You don't know the rules. You have to pay attention to well, what are the rules? Can you figure them out? Uh, or maybe there is someone who will tell you, oh, don't talk to that person, or that person has the power, or yes, you you have to interact with this person the right way, or here's our expectation of how you you know present yourself. And so many of the rules are unwritten. And that can determine uh, a person's success or failure in an organization, whether or not they can figure out what these rules are and know how to navigate them effectively. I know I've said a whole lot for your listeners in that, but I'm sure there are listeners out there who are like, oh, yeah, I think I can identify with that because there are people I like, I don't like, you know. (laughs) And yes, that's normal. (laughs) But then I'll say one little line to your listeners. If you don't like someone, if you dislike someone in the workplace, remember you're in the workplace. And don't so, tell anybody else. That would be a big Yes. One. <laughs> yeah, don't tell anyone keep else. Keep it to yourself. And I mean, how you feel. Keep it to, and how keep you it to yourself. Mm-hmm. And look for something in that person that they offer to the workplace. Because there's, everybody has a, like what I like to call, 
a loving spirit deep within. There's an essence of humanness. And attempt to connect with that essence of humanness so that you can work with that person uh, and recognize this is a person you work with. It's not a person you live with, which is two totally different things. But I just have to say, and I'm sure your listeners know, there are so many dynamics that go into the workplace um, because people are there. Because when we come together, there are just various things, dynamics that happen, which could be positive and or negative. Oh, and I know I could ramble, so please well, hold me in and question. ask specific I'm questions a, if you'd like I'm, to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, I I was go waiting. on and on. <laughs> no, no, I love it. I mean, you're doing a great job, and I think it's so interesting, and you certainly got my curiosity up when I started. The reason I wanted to interrupt here right here is because I'm sure our listeners are thinking some of the same things I am because I'm listening to you. And all of us have workplaces. I mean, you know, we, you know, there's some of us that are listeners here or just home and stuck at home for whatever reasons, but most of us are out there in the world, in workplaces, experiencing these things. So I'm significantly curious about two, three, four, five of those rules that should be in the conscious mind. We just said one a second ago which is basically don't participate in gossip. But that is so seductive to talk, to get into gossip with somebody <laughs> and to say the negatives and to think reductionistically and categorically about a person and typify them, as you were just saying a moment ago, as a 100% negative cipher on the scorecard. And that is what happens. And so let's but really staying with the subject of sexual harassment. Could you tell us some things that, I mean, I've, I've actually seen women who were in the situation. So much of it is the guys are wrong. And many times it is guys because they have a sense of, Hey, this is what I do or whatever. Who knows? And they certainly have a low self-esteem. They want approval. If they're going to get approval in the workplace, they're going to get approval from somebody who looks good and smells good. But you know, the issue is, I've, I've seen women do the same thing, cross boundaries in the workplace. And so the issue is, it's not a gender specific thing. I think it's really an issue of, let's talk about those rules in a general way, if we could. If you would, you'd all be very appreciative. In a very general way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. You, well, you, you I'll, do I'll, you want. I'll, I'll, I'll address, I'll address, this is one thing that I, I, I like to do a little over view of my perspective here on sexual harassment. So sexual harassment is, um, is usually, you know, it's a form of this, it's considered a form of employment discrimination uh, under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And, um, and so what it simply means is that you are, uh, doing some kind of behavior and a conduct towards someone that may have a sexual nature or sexual connotation to it. And then therefore that is consider considered to be um, possibly sexual harassment. But there's several criteria that uh, it has to meet in order to be considered sexual harassment. So it's not just that someone approaches you and says they like you and says they'd like to take you out for a date uh, that's that's just someone asking you out. That's not necessarily yeah. sexual harassment. Yep, uh, you know, and 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 one and one of the confusions that people get is that they think that just because it's sexual in nature, such as it's a sexual joke or it's this or it's a sexual picture, that it's automatically sexual harassment. Um, so there's two types of sexual harassment. There's a hostile work environment and there's quid pro quo. A hostile work environment is usually there's conduct or something going on and it could be or it could be behavior or it could be items or anything that creates an environment uh, that has a sexual connotation behind it. So that includes such things as pictures. Uh, it could be uh, sexual emails. It could be um, uh, songs. It could be... Uh, uh, any kind of language. Uh, it could be someone who's sending, bringing you flowers and cards and they, they're asking you out repeatedly for dates or they could touch you on a body part or, uh, or grab your, I think somebody was accused of, of touching someone's 
uh, but or yep. uh, any of those things could, that, that, that lends itself to be they've created a hostile work environment and it could be considered inappropriate behavior that could lead to sexual harassment or it's happened pervasively that means more than once and that could be considered possibly a sexual harassment. So then there's part of it was, oh, go ahead. That's it. So you're that first one. Just to interrupt for a quick second. A hostile work environment. A little. To, it's a hostile work environment, but it is a crossing of a boundary without permission. Yes, definitely crossing of a boundary without permission. But the the, the piece about where you could have uh, like posters of a sexual nature. Back in the day, you said we had certain environments such as police departments, fire departments, traditionally male, and they may have calendar girls, all these kinds of posters, nude photos, pinups. It could have been part of lockers in the workplace. And when those particular uh, workplaces were uh, then infiltrated with women and where more women were brought into the non-traditional work roles, uh, they were asked to clean those up. And so a lot of, so some of the stem out of how environments were occurring were, you know, people were overstepping the, to what would be considered appropriate in the workplace. Mm -hmm. uh, so then, then we have, that's, so that's hostile work environment. Then we have quid pro quo. Quid pro quo is usually, it's, it's always actually, it has to be a supervisor, manager, someone who has the authority to hire, fire, discipline, who has asked, for possibly a sexual favor. If you do this for me, I'll do that for you. Yeah. That's quid pro quo. So when we're hearing about things in the news where we have people who have, uh, they've been the leaders in the workplaces, they are the managers, the supervisors, the VP of, the owner of the company, where they have that power, then that's quid pro quo. If they've asked someone to, you do this for me, then I'll do that for you, then that's quid pro quo. If they've done that, if they just if they've touched someone but they haven't asked for a this for that, then it's hostile work environment. They created gotcha. a hostile work gotcha. environment. Uh, the thing though that I have a concern with is that um, there are because we live in the world we live in, you know, uh, and because our workplace more than uh, and we have so many men and women both in the workplace. Oftentimes, I think a lot of people think that what they can do outside of the workplace, they can do inside of the workplace. They think that if I ask someone at a bar, if I, you know, uh, I'm being persuasive by repeatedly asking them out, I'm approaching them in a certain way, I'm saying certain things to them, you know, out here in the general world, that I can go into the workplace and do the same thing. The workplace is not a bar. The workplace <laughs> is not uh, a place where you're supposed to be trying to, uh, come on to people. That doesn't mean somebody's not going to ask you out for a date, <laughs> but it, it's not a, you have to pay attention to what is the law, how the organization has to make sure that everyone has an environment in which they can be effective and successful. Based on law, it cannot be a hostile work environment. It has to be harassment free uh, because those are protected by law. So I think a lot of people, unfortunately, do not understand how their behavior crosses the boundary. They do not understand what behavior crosses the boundary. They have not necessarily received appropriate training on what behavior is appropriate and inappropriate mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. workplace. Yeah. Uh, and actually, the Supreme Court laid down um, that that could be uh, a, a requirement of organizations that they actually train their base. So what a lot of organizations are doing are simply having their employees watch a video or having their employees watch a PowerPoint or a webinar on sexual harassment. And I have a little bit of an issue with that because it really just tells people what the law is. It doesn't help people to understand how their behavior could possibly be crossing the boundary. Uh, it, it doesn't cover every behavior. Uh, and so people think that, oh, I can do this here, but I can do it in the workplace as well. And that's not the case. Uh, and sexual harassment has become this huge kind of mirror, I think, for us to look at 
and to begin to look at how do we really interact with the people around us in the workplace. Now, you know, you know, I'm going to ask, ask you a quick go question ahead. here because you got me going on this. And I, I'm identifying with you presen uh, doing presentations to corporate America. And I'm thinking about you going over these, and you're an expert on it. You've had considerable experience with it. And this is a little bit putting you on the spot, so you may have to think about it for a second. But I'm wondering what was the most challenging question that you had coming from the audience in, in any memorable way that you said, oh, my gosh, that is a big murky area, and this is where you have to go with it. Do you have... Anything, you know, anything like that in mind, that would certainly pique my interest because the answer to that question would be a really loaded answer, which would break out a lot of this. Do you have anything like that in mind? <laughs> That's interesting because I've been asked a lot of questions. Um, I think a, a, uh, there, there, there are three that stand out in my mind because they they, they – they, they warranted a lot of conversation uh, in the classroom. One had to do with um, the cultural differences that we have because we have uh, one for the first time in U.S. history, we have four generations in the workplace at the same time. Mm. Uh, also, we have very... It depends on where you live. So I don't I don't so it depends on where the audience lives. Some cities, some areas have very diverse populations in the workplace. And people's cultural uh, backgrounds, of course, are not the same. And so our tolerances, our boundaries are not the same. Mm -hmm. So uh, for instance, there was this gentleman who told this story. It was absolutely fantastic. Uh, he is from, I believe, Nigeria, but he's from, a, I believe that's the country. I, uh, and so he, his thing was, in his country, they always invite someone. They, they always eat with someone. And so he said, we, uh, he said, I will ask people out at lunchtime, you know, and he said, I'll say I'll treat. And he said he found that he had to, um, really explain and pay attention and explain his culture when he does that so that if he asks a female colleague out, they won't think that he's coming on to them, that he's asking them for a date <laughs> when mm -hmm. he's simply saying, let's have lunch together because in my culture, we don't eat alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was interesting because we have to go into a cultural conversation and that is something that really shows up culturally that we, we don't have the same boundaries. Yes. Uh, and we do not uh, view um, certain amounts of touching. There's just a difference in how we are in our perspectives and how we see the world and in our yes. boundaries. So that was a big issue. That was a big conversation yeah. in the workplace. Uh, an another huge example in the workplace, and this is an interesting one because someone even brought this up to me the other day, and I thought it was interesting that it's still a part of our conversation. And that was around, I had a gentleman say, well, is she, is a woman sexually harassing me if her clothing is provocative? And I said, well, no, because it's your particular perception that determines whether something's provocative. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Point. So just be, just be, just because someone is wearing something, you do not have a right to cross a boundary. Yeah. You do not just because someone uh, and and because and, you know based it on styles and fashion. You know, at some point the skirt is very high. You yeah. know, about on the thigh. Uh, another time it may be long. Uh, you know, you have off the shoulder blouses. You have uh, you know. Uh, you know, and everybody has different body shapes and they look very differently in clothing, but that does not mean that someone is harassing you because of their clothing, because you don't, because you are responsible for your own behavior mm -hmm. and it's upon you not to cross a boundary into that person's rights or into that person's space, regardless as to what they have on and what you think of it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
Good point. Uh, because that goes back to the that goes back to the old point that you know back in the day, uh, there was a time when when the, the defense for rapists was that the woman was provocative or having provocative clothing. I didn't know that. Ah. Way back in the day, yes, way back in the day, that that they that was an attempt of using that defense, and that is not a defense. For men or women, if a man looks sexy to you, uh, he's wearing that color that just, you know, connects with his eyes, it still doesn't give you a right to go up and touch his face, touch his eyes or whatever, because you are attractive. You have to maintain another person's boundaries. Uh, you cannot overstep their boundaries. Um, so it doesn't give you the right to do that. So that was the second example. And then third example, uh, which I found quite interesting, is that what responsibility do you have when you see something else happen to someone? When you see something happen to someone yeah. else? Yeah. So if, uh, you know, there's such a thing as third-party harassment. So if you see that someone is overstepping someone else's boundaries and you can tell by the body language or by the comment that someone is saying that they're uncomfortable, that they don't want something to be occurring, or you know about something, and that's the big thing that's, you know, going on in Hollywood now about so many people knew or, you know, everybody knew about this, but no one was saying anything or doing yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah. So the question becomes, what are you willing to do? Are you willing to speak up for someone else? Uh, and that's a question that I think that it behooves all of us to think about deeply because we are in a society where so often people will say, well, that's not my business. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I just have to take care of me uh, and that's on them. And that often happens in the workplace, I believe, that people will, uh, will say, well, I don't want to be involved. Uh, they may come and bother me. I don't want to be fired. I don't want to be caught up in somebody else's stuff. All those things. But I think it's important for us to then to put ourselves in the shoes of the recipient. Yeah, yeah. You know, what would it feel, you know, what would you want to happen if you were in that person's shoes? What would you want to happen if your child, your parent, your sister, your brother, your uncle, aunt, best friend, whoever was in that position? What would you want to happen? Would you want someone to speak up on their behalf? And if you can say yes, then why would you not speak up on someone's behalf? And there are ways to speak up. I mean, you don't, you know, you don't have to go confront the person. You know, there are ways, there are supposed to be ways within the organization to speak up, uh, to be able to let someone know that something's going on or someone's boundaries are being invaded. Um, yeah, that is a very interesting example because, you know, if our society is much more uh, encouraging of the nuance, addressing the nuance before it becomes a problem, then people are much more likely to be in line because, you know, the idea that nobody's going to say anything, the permission and the really um, enabling the behavior is going to be much less wow. likely to be tolerated because if you're enabling, in a way, you're brought into complicity. Oh, yes. And Most definitely. And I, I think people often forget about that, that I'm complicit with this. And see, and I find the whole Hollywood situation regarding sexual harassment to be quite interesting. I am not in Hollywood, but I remember years and years ago hearing about the casting couch. Yeah. So I find it interesting that, you know, now it's, it's all of a sudden coming to light and bubbling up and it's huge and everybody's speaking out. And so the question is, how many of you all already knew about this? And why weren't you saying anything? Yeah. You know, and I find it interesting that now people are talking, uh, but I, I put that too, that we're going through a lot in our world where a lot of the ugliness that's been in the past are now bubbling up for us to take a look at so we can take a look at ourselves. I think it's so true. I think really what you're saying and saying is slightly differently, but in really the same way 
is we're much more aware of a group consciousness with the very way you started your presentation talking about the fact that the group is not a, it, it's a different entity in terms of the way you think about it. And if we have a responsibility to the group consciousness, we're actually taking ownership for encouraging that level of responsibility as a member, a functioning member of that group, as opposed to being complicit. And that's, that's yes. what you're saying, right? Basically, we are going to have to uh, have to really not have to, we're just doing it. It's a natural course in society because we've seen the tragedies that have occurred by silence. And it's been many, many years of silence. You know, you wonder what happened to people like Marilyn Monroe, for example. What actually yes. happened to her? Uh, right. And she's, she's pretty explicit. And I didn't read the material, but I read a little bit about it. And, and you know, and then you've seen the documentaries on, on Netflix about what happened with various players back then. But we're running a little bit out of time. We do have to take a break because I'm going to ask you this other question when we get back. And you have so many interesting things to talk about. But the question I'm going to ask you, which is absolutely germane, which is one of the ways we actually came together in, in talking is, thank you so much for telling us a little bit about what the nature of the problem is. What we're going to come back, folks, is after this brief break from our sponsors, we're going to ask what you know the entire situation is, what you all thinks about what to do about it. Hey, isn't that what we're about here at Corporate Journal? Okay, this is what the problem is. What do we do about it? We talked a little bit about what we do it on the group. Now we're going to talk a little bit about what we're going to do it from the individual's point of view. With that, we're going to take a break. Be back in just a moment. Well, folks, you know as well as I do that psychiatric treatment failure, especially after multiple medication trials and those very, very brief hospitalizations, may prove insufficient to deal at home with the complexity of troubled children and, and those adolescents from 6 to 17 years old. Improved care, those next mandatory steps, should include a more comprehensive approach to address those multiple levels of challenges, from family to peers to school, diagnostically from defiance to depression, on every level for families, including military families, internationally. The Barry Robinson Center's 32-acre open college-like campus in Norfolk, Virginia, provides safety and security and clean, comfortable living how do we know? We refer folks over there all the time, strongly endorse what they're doing. So for further information and informed interview, connect at this page, barryrobinson.org forward slash core. Well, you folks already know that here at Core Brain Journal, we're on a mission to introduce you to resources that make significant contributions to the investigation of those predictable mind science applications. Our colleagues at DHA Lab Group provide a real difference with treatment options for people at every level, from first awareness of mind problems to those frustrating times when even well-informed treatment becomes surprisingly unpredictable. For my entire professional life, from psychoanalysis to brain scans, I've searched for, yes, improved predictability. The good news for all of us, from professionals to patients, remarkably effective research offers useful cost-effective, organic options far beyond guesswork with psychiatric medications alone. DHA lab tests measure unbalanced biomedical details through easily available testing, now available globally for a variety of molecular answers from, for example, methylation, copper, and cryptopyrrole challenges. Check in for more details at dhalab.com core. That's D H A L A B dot com forward slash core. Well, thanks again, you all, for coming on board because this is such an interesting and such a timely conversation because all of us need to think more deeply about these matters instead of just swimming around in our heads wondering where we go. And we appreciate your guidance in this regard. Let's take the remaining time to talk about what you as a professional think could be helpful with individuals who are in the circumstance of the problem 
what can they do about it? How can they heal? That's a whole range of multiple questions and multiple answers. Please start that conversation, if you will. Okay. Well, so definitely, if you're in a situation in your workplace where you think that you are being harassed and sexually harassed, the key, of course, is to report it uh, to the, most organizations, not all, have a complaint process. Uh, and so follow that complaint process. And if you're not satisfied with the, with the results of the complaint process, and even at the same time, you're making the internal complaint process, you can always go to EEOC or the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission because they are responsible for uh, tracking and investigating uh, harassment and sexual harassment claims in workplaces in the United States. And so that's one of the first things you want to do is definitely take care of yourself that way. Uh, if you're afraid to, to report it inside the organization, go directly to EEOC. Uh, you can look up their information uh, online. They're all over the place. You know, they are a federal agency and there's always local EEOC offices in every city. Uh, there's a place to go. Uh, there's telephone numbers and emails and all that to, to contact them. But, but moving it out of that realm and going into what can we do as individuals, um, I think you made a very uh, an excellent point in the first half of the show regarding how uh, it's about the boundaries. It's about being able to understand uh, where you are and where someone else's space begins and recognizing that we're all human and to respect another person's space. Uh, so that simply means uh, that you are not touching someone without their permission. Uh, you are talking to people in a way that is, um, it doesn't uh, demean them in any fashion. Uh, so, uh, but it, it, here's one thing, I have to make this little point. What I so often find is that the people who overstep boundaries don't understand boundaries. The people who are um, the people who are saying stuff that's not appropriate don't understand appropriateness. Yeah. That's so a I so point, yeah. so I yeah so so one of the huge uh, things that I like to say to anybody who's in an organization who has any kind of influence on bringing training into your organization is that you actually bring training into the organization so that you can train your employees on appropriateness as far as behavior in the organization. And unfortunately, that's a space that a lot of times organizations don't want to spend money. And they've, they've, they've gone to the shortcut of let's do a webinar uh, or, or let's just give them a video to watch as opposed to actually conducting in-person training. And it doesn't have to be long but you can't, people have that opportunity to have the action and ask questions that you just can't do on something like a webinar, or you just can't do it by watching a video. There are all these questions that, that like the, all the, the three examples of those that I gave you, we had those conversations in the classroom because people were able to ask those questions. And they couldn't have gotten those kinds of, that kind of information from a webinar or from watching a video. That's so Another true. Thing. I mean, I, as you were saying, and I was uh, very much appreciating that point because I was thinking it's, it's a nuanced situation. I mean, boundaries yes. are so fuzzy and so complex based on the way people were raised, what their experience is. I mean, if you're raised in the South versus raised in the North. Oh, I yes. Mean, just based Huge on difference. in the South, people will put their hands on you more frequently. It's just yes. what people yes. do. And if you do that, it's what people hard, do. They think, oh my gosh, it's uh, you know some kind of intrusion, and so you know it's a, it's an interesting point. I'll I'll stop talking, but I I no, think no, that's, that, that's an excellent point. That's an excellent point because I I literally had to train myself out of touching people when I talked to them, because it was a part of I I part of my childhood was in the South, and that's just a part of how you communicate with people. You touch them on the elbow, you touch them on the back when you're saying something. But that's something that not everyone wants that. So I also say, put out to people that if something like that happens, consider 
why is it happening? Because I think we're a very um, litigious society. Yeah. So often, so often people are like, oh, he touched me. It's harassment. Yeah. No, not necessarily. <laughs> yeah. Unless they grab a sexual body part immediately, that's probably going to be considered sexual harassment. But if they just touched you on the shoulder or the arm or something like that one time, no. Uh, you know, that's not necessarily sexual harassment. So they you know, you're saying careful. the elbow is not a body part. <laughs> it's a body part, <laughs> but at the same time, a one-time situation where someone touches you on the elbow or the or the back because they're chatting with you or whatever is not necessarily by law yeah. going to be considered sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. However, an organization could say you're not supposed to touch the person that's inappropriate behavior. That's different. Inappropriate behavior can lead to sexual harassment, but not all inappropriate behavior, unless it's pervasive and consistent. You tell the person to stop, they don't stop. Then that can be considered pervasive and it's an issue. Because the boundary has been so, drawn as opposed to yes. being vague. The boundary is exactly. out there and it's either set, you just said it. The boundary is set by the organization, what's appropriate and inappropriate. That would be a boundary. And either people can follow yes. the rule or they're going to exactly. Break. So tell exactly. So definitely, if you if something's going on, if you want someone to stop, say stop. Be very clear. Don't him. Don't call. Don't do not. No, do I not just beat around the bush. Mm -hmm. Say please stop that behavior. I don't think it's appropriate, or it bothers me, or concerns me. It makes me feel uncomfortable. Say all of it, yeah. <laughs> and the person should stop. If they don't stop. That's an issue. You definitely report it. That's an issue. And, uh, and it, it extends to customers, clients, vendors, anybody that comes into your workplace. Everybody's got all of that's covered. So let's talk. You, you specifically asked a question, though, about um, what do if you are uh, a victim uh, of this kind of a situation? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the various things I just mentioned as far as those illegal things. But then also, Sometimes that can stay with you. Uh, Beverly Cyril and I uh, just finished, we can finish conducting a study a couple of months ago regarding post-traumatic stress disorder. And we did it specifically around adverse events or trauma that occurs in the workplace. And with our study, uh, I think we had two people who were actually harassed in the workplace. And these people actually had experience. We, we use what's called the DOS 21 scale. This is a psychological assessment to determine uh, whether or not they had anxiety uh, or depression or stress. And then we also use what's called uh, the PCLC, which is a post-traumatic stress disorder checklist <clears throat> that was developed for civilians. Uh, they use it with the military as well. And we discovered that uh, the people who had experienced workplace harassment, uh, these particular people definitely had PTSD. So it, it depends on um, not every person who experiences harassment in the workplace will end up having PTSD or depression or anxiety or stress, but some people will. Yes. Uh, and so for those people, not only finding out if people had uh, stress, depression, or, or anxiety, or PTSD from workplace trauma, but also we were using a process called the My Envision um, Mind, which was developed by Beverly Cyril, and she's based in Australia. Uh, we used her process to work with people on actually alleviating the PTSD. And uh, it was only a 10-hour process, and most of the, the uh, work that we did was over uh, Skype. And, uh, and we had a significant, significant results uh, from our study. Uh, everyone who had any level of depression, anxiety, and stress, or PTSD, uh, we brought them down way below the process, rather, not we. The process brought them down way below... Uh, what would consider the normal levels. Now, thank you so much for bringing up Beverly Udall because we've met with Beverly twice here on Core Brain Journal, 
And, you know, I really should have prepared for this moment audio, but I'll have it in the show notes, the two other episodes that we have with Beverly, where she really goes into these things from PTSD, dissociative identity disorder, a variety of, but that particular program that she's developed has been uniquely constructive in a person working through these traumatic issues. And, and I'm just so glad that you've had a chance to work with her and do this important research. And so the conclusion of the research, are you there? Do you have a conclusion about what you found? I mean, we were talking a little bit vaguely about it. Was there, were there some specific things that you want to share with us? Well, yes, the, the intervention is non-invasive. And what I mean, non-invasive, what I mean by that is you don't have to recall and go back and talk about the every experience that you had that brought about your stress, your anxiety, and your PTSD. Uh, it's a way of being able to directly go into where trauma is stored in your brain. And you're doing all the work. We're just guiding you, you know, with the process. And you go in and you're able to literally change how your mind actually responds to these uh, events uh, in order for them not to hinder you or hold you back in your being, you know, your actually living life. And so our results uh, actually just indicate that the process, the mind vision process actually improves and actually alleviates, I'm going to say that, it's an intervention that actually alleviates depression, stress, anxiety, and PTSD. Um, and, and when I first met Beverly, I decided to do a, I'm a PhD candidate, so I decided to do a research paper on her process to determine whether or not it was actually based in some, what I consider to be some relevant theory. Mm -hmm. And so when I did my paper and discovered, oh, wow, this is really based, I could trace it back to a combination of a couple of very uh, solid theorists. And she was able to, to pull out pieces that other people had just seemed to overlook mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know, put in her own process to develop this great process. I decided to go with her and do a study on it to, to make sure, to see if it actually worked with PTSD in the workplace. And yeah, the results were absolutely, absolutely fantastic. We had an increase, uh, let's see, um, people improved 82% for depression, 77% for anxiety, 86% for stress. And we, our study uh, started with them at the beginning. We did an assessment. We did an assessment right after they completed the 10 hours of the intervention. And then we did a study, a test or an assessment six months later, because we wanted to make sure that it wasn't sort of like a halo effect right after yes. the 10 hours. So we waited, you know, we waited a good six months to make, to see, did it stick? And at the end of six months, uh, you know, it, the numbers were even better. So, so all I can say is, we're very pleased. <laughs> well, you know, we're very you know, pleased I can to say, oh, yes, it actually works. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and it's stuck. And I think another thing that has a dramatic utilitarian value is the fact oh, that you did it in so. 10 hours. I mean, yes, in 10 hours. And it worked with, so, so the, what's interesting is it, it, it's not um, your type of PTSD, or, such as, you know, what the trauma was doesn't determine whether it works. It's just the fact that there was a trauma uh, that, that uh, determines that it works. Because we had people who had a couple of sexual harassment uh, participants. We had someone who had, had been involved in an armed robbery at work. We had someone who had manager bullying. We had someone who actually had vicarious re-traumatization, which is something that... Uh, often comes with uh, secondhand trauma comes with uh, uh, first responders uh, such as police officers yes. and EMTs and firefighters. Yes. Uh, they may not be directly involved, but they uh, suffer secondhandly by always seeing trauma. And so I think, you know, I think doctors could too. Uh, possibly have that. But I'm not sure if doctors have been studied. That's a group I need to look at. I'm telling <laughs> as you. Well, I think. Yeah, I just thought about that. It just came to my mind. That, oh, look at doctors. Right there. I mean, you know, 
why do mm -hmm. individuals who are in mental health become more and more sequestered in their offices and and leave groups and then when they enter groups become so dogmatically opinionated and defensive i mean you know that's oh, yeah that, that is a very very commonplace situation it's almost like if you're a psychiatrist, you believe in the cathartic theory of mental health. You know, just get it out of your system. It's like you're carrying a thought around and it's poison and you're just going to say it under any circumstances. I mean, it is really kind of reflex action without thinking. And uh, yeah, I believe all so. All the time. And it's, yeah. it's, it's almost uh, ubiquitous. I mean, in my experience, watching, it's not everybody, but it does happen. And you can imagine what those individuals have been through with a lifetime of non-productive, uh, they didn't actually dissemble the situation properly. Yeah, I think that that's an excellent point. And you know, what's, what's even, I think it's even more interesting. I was just paying attention to this before we started the show. And that is, there's a conversation going on about whether or not a lot of us are actually, uh, because we're being bombarded with so much violence and yes. trauma on television, yes. that does this continuous bombardment of this actually create vicarious traumatization? You know, mm -hmm. are we actually suffering uh, from maybe even just a mild form of PTSD because of everything that we have access to right now. Well, to just take a little bit of a quick psychoanalytic trip, and we do have to wind up, but, you know, one of the things that uh, has been very uh, alive for, for many, many years, even from the days of early psychoanalysis, was the whole business of turning passive experience into active mastery by repeating it with another person. So what happens is if a person's traumatized, a child goes to the dentist and she's frightened and she's drilled by the dentist repeatedly. Maybe the pain medication doesn't work or whatever. Well, what she does is go home and takes her doll out and drills the doll relentlessly. That's turning the passive experience of being on the recipient end, the vicarious point that you were raising just a moment ago, and turning it into active mastery. And, and some are thinking that this is, goes on with even shooters. And, I, and I, I just saw this recently. I think it was in the Wall Street Journal about concerns after the Texas shooting that others would then have experienced that, turn it into active mastery, and wind up doing a similar uh, catastrophe tragedy. It could definitely be a concern, and I see it on a, a milder, that it would be milder with the general population, though, in that, yes, you may have someone who goes out and do those really massive kinds of mastery, but I think that there are more people who are doing the cyberbullying and uh, yeah, talking right. nasty to other people and calling people names in the parking lot and mm -hmm. just a, an overall kind of attitude that people have toward each other after experiencing everything that's going on in the world. So I think I think that we're doing it. I think we're doing it, but we're doing it on a on a different level than the the larger yeah experience. Of there is there is a nuance to it. Of course, I think I appreciate that may, you're making that point of clarification because that is so true. I mean, if you're turning the uh, whole sense of being traumatized into an act of mastery, well, then the issue is, are, is it okay for you to be traumatic with another person? And somehow right. then you develop an internal sense of confidence, whereas you were frightened before, now you're no longer frightened because you're in control. Your self-esteem is restored by you doing that to someone else in some weird way. Yes. And what's interesting, what's going on, and I think we could talk all day about this because we're, we're, I'm moving a little bit from the workplace, but I think it's all connected because we're all connected as humans. And I, I'm very much into that collective mindset that we have going on. And we look at what's going on with so many people are ODing, you know, 
which says to me that there's a lot of people in pain. A lot of, there's mm-hmm. so many, you know, they're expecting the suicide rate to be up in the millions, you know, uh, by the end of the year. So you, you go, hmm, this is interesting. All these trends that are going on, well, this is a lot of pain. Where are people getting all this pain from? You know, we're, we're, why, why are we wearing all this pain? How is it being, how is it coming to us? Mm-hmm. Is everyone's life so, so really, really, really bad? And, you know, I, I think it's the, how we are, uh, our, our resilience level is something to look at as well. Mm-hmm. But then resilience is built up usually starting in childhood. It's a little harder, I think, as you become an adult. And what I like about the mind vision mind process is that it can help remove a lot of any kind of traumatic stuff you had growing up as a child, which can interfere with your having resilience here today as an adult. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, and, resilience and so is a so whole, whole other good subject. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So uh, it's it's. I love this work. It's exciting. So you know, thank you so much for allowing me to oh, share my little. Thank you for coming on. Things. I really appreciate our going into the conversation more extensively. You all now tell us how we can get in contact with you, and we'll put that in the show notes. But if you could tell us here for the audio, we deeply appreciate. Okay, it. sure. You could definitely visit my website at www all about relationships dot us so dot us uh, and there you'll find all of the kinds of training coaching work that I do because I am a coach as well and um, and we're going to and you can also go to www envision mine your I mean I'm sorry my envision mine dot com mm-hmm. so that's www my envision mine dot com and there you will I'm associated with my envision mind with the actual process because I'm one of the only certified uh, counselors or coaches for the my envision mind process in the United States. No, that's fantastic. And yes. Yes. But, yeah. Thank you. Because yes, she's in Australia and she's actually going to be visiting the United States in February of 2018. Oh, that's great. Yeah. She's yeah, so, very, uh, very interesting. And, you know, if you get hooked yes. up with uh, here with you all, you'll get a chance to connect with Beverly, which would be. Oh, definitely, definitely. And I can actually take you through the process. And uh, But we're giving away um, of the PTSD self-help kit. We're going to tell you, we're going to offer that to you to, uh, as uh, in your, I, I heard that you have a competition or something for your yeah, listeners. Yeah, really, And uh, yeah, that's going we're, to be. We're, we're great. That, that's fantastic. You're, you're, you are going to do that because uh, I had a note that you weren't going to do something, but that, if you connect with Tiffany gonna... on that, we'll definitely have it available on the show notes because we would love to connect people with you. It's what we do. We think the conversation can certainly be encouraged by our having the conversation and connecting with other people out there. We, we're at this le- most recent time in 94 countries, so... That's, oh, fabulous. I'm yeah. so, so glad to hear that. So, yes, so we're offering a, a free PTSD ebook, and then uh, for you to uh, definitely have the drawing for our PTSD self help kit, which has a value of $297. So, we're, we're, we're definitely going to make sure that that's available for you. Well, that's great. Well, make sure, please, I'll try to remember to talk to Tiffany about that tomorrow. But if you would drop her an email as soon as we hang up, that'd be great because we'll jump on that. We'd love to have it, we'd love to do it for you with you. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I say to your listening audience, thank you so much for allowing me to be with all of you all. And definitely come to my website, my telephone number is out there, my email address. Uh, Contact me if you have any uh, questions about sexual harassment prevention. Uh, Also, uh, this particular process, the Mind Vision Mind process works with uh, any kind of trauma you've had in your life, be it from childhood, be it in present day, including things like a divorce. A divorce can have you hung up for years. years. And you'll find on my website that I'm actually, I work with people who want to get uh, over a divorce so they can move over and move on and find the second love of their life. Um, so, so yeah, definitely contact me. I'd love to work with you. And please let me know that you heard about me on the Core Brain Show. Well, oh, thank you so much, Udall. Thank you for coming on, and thanks for such a clear, explicit discussion of some of the things we can do with such a commonplace problem. We, there are some answers out there, folks, so thanks again, Udall. Appreciate it. Thank you. 
Have a good evening, girl. Thanks for listening to Core Brain Journal. We're working every day behind the scenes to bring you reports that connect research benches with those street trenches. Here we share the complexity of mind science because, as you know, details really do matter. One of the most pervasive misunderstood challenges is how commonplace medications like those written for ADHD are used so regularly without clear guidelines. If you think you'd like more specifics, take a minute to download my two-page PDF packed with video links and references on the absolute essentials of how to start ADHD medications. They're easily available at corebrainjournal.com forward slash start. Thanks for listening. Do connect and stay tuned. Together we can make a difference.